the former Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, Deep Dattare, Felthji, Mr. and Mrs. Sunanda Dattare. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you this evening for the launch of Deep's book. We are very glad that the former Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, is with us today. It has been my privilege to work with him for 10 years as his special envoy. As regards the theme of the book, I think both his, India's worldview has always been shaped by historical experience and contemporary developments. Centuries of connections with the outside world on a continuous basis with different religions and cultures, the colonial experience, the peaceful and democratic nature of our freedom struggle, and the fact that both partition and integration took place simultaneously at the time of independence cannot be underestimated. These have produced a culture of thinking in our country, which promotes pluralism and democracy, both within and amongst nations. This has, in a way, influenced our political, economic, security, and foreign policies. I got a copy of the book last night and hurriedly glanced through it. It's well researched. I do not share all the facts and the conclusions which the author has reached, but I am sure we will have a very interesting discussion on it. He traces the impact of the Mahabharata, the medieval age, uh, the colonial experience, Gandhiji's Satyagraha on our diplomacy. He makes only a fleeting reference to Arthashtra uh, in the book, but it, as I was telling him, one always learns. It's only reading through the book quickly last night that I learned that the Arthashtra was rediscovered for us only in 1905. Well, with these few words, I welcome you once again and request the author, Deep Dattare, to present a book to the former Prime Minister. Before we have a discussion, I will now request Dr. Faisal Devji, reader in Indian history, St. Anthony's College, Oxford University, to say a few words. Well, the Right Honorable Dr. Singh, Ambassador Lamba, uh, Dr. Dattare, Mr. and Mrs. Sunanda Dattare, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I just want to say a few words before handing the floor over to Deep uh, to tell us more about his book. Uh, and all I wanted to say, in fact, was that when I read the manuscript, uh, which I had the honor of endorsing subsequently, I was taken aback at its provocative and original nature. Because Deep, it seems to me, uh, is not simply telling us something about the inherited nature or differences uh, of Indian foreign policy. Uh, he is not referring to the historical or national peculiarities of that policy, uh, but he is in fact asking us to think about its critical and conceptual nature. Uh, 
Uh, and this, I think, is a rather important thing to do uh, because we are so awash in discussions about the modern state as a generic phenomenon, uh, which countries like India come close to words or fall short of uh, approximating. And this Deep is not interested in. Uh, neither is he entirely or solely interested in matters of policy and how policies change uh, over the decades of the Indian Republic. Uh, he very creatively, I think, brings together the world of policy and the institutional and bureaucratic structure of the Ministry of External Affairs and the life cycles of diplomats from the often small towns and even villages whence they come uh, to what happens to them and where they end up going to. So we, we have a wonderful package in which you can follow the career path of uh, uh, a foreign affairs official, think about the structures, the institutional structures of the ministry and how these combine together with many other factors to produce policy, which is not the be all and end all of uh, uh, India's engagement uh, with the world. So I won't say more about it uh, now, I'm sure we'll hear a great deal more about what Deep uh, argues in this book. I just wanted to begin with these few statements and invite Deep to um, address us, after which we shall have a short conversation. Uh, I will have the privilege of having a short conversation with Deep and then open it up uh, to you in the audience. Deep. Deep. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Devji, and thank you very much to Aspen Ananta for organizing this and to former Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh for gracing us with his presence. Let me begin with, uh, with a contention. If the character of a nation state is expressed in the conduct of its foreign policy, then India's foreign policy belies the very notion that it is a nation state for that conceptual category was invented in the West. And India's diplomacy, quite evidently, is nothing like how Western nation states conduct their international relations. Let me illustrate with two examples. Unlike Europe or the United States, India is neither fixated on its borders nor on maintaining them. Rather, India seeks to blend the world the example par excellence from recent times is the 123 agreement. <clears throat> Crafted by Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh, the agreement broke a racially motivated and international barrier assiduously crafted by the West since World War II. In addition to this uncommon capacity of viewing the world in terms of not permanently divided units, but a totality, and in seeking to foster it, is India's ability to also not view the world as a zero-sum game, divided between permanent allies and enemies. For instance, note and contrast New Delhi's excellent links with Tehran, Washington, and Jerusalem, with, on the other hand, the Western powers' alliance politics. Indeed, this is the norm which reiterates Indian exceptionalism. In short then, my project seeks to determine why New Delhi plays fast and loose with the borders upon which the West, and perhaps Peking's, diplomacy is founded, and how India does so. Let me give you the answer right away. The why and how of Indian diplomacy arises from a totally novel and perhaps uniquely Indian way of conceptualizing the world. In other words, Indians conceptualize the world in ways unavailable to foreigners, and hence New Delhi can operate in ways that confound other diplomatic services. This is because at the core of New Delhi's diplomacy is a worldview unlike the West. India's worldview is cosmological. When I say cosmological, <clears throat> 
I mean that Indians conceptualize themselves as inextricably intermeshed and interlinked with everything else in the universe. This belief makes for a way of approaching foreign policy quite novel. Firstly, India, unlike civilizations descended from Christianity or Islam, does not seek to move out of anarchy or what is called, known as jahiliya in an ordained manner so as to arrive at a utopia or paradise. In practical terms, what this means is that Indians, by dint of their culture, are not linear in their thinking. Instead, they are contextual. To explain, just as Indian diplomats make judgments based on their immediate context about what to do, so too does India decide how to act based on its immediate context. Let us take the case of individuals first. For instance, and in stark contrast to Western diplomats, no Indian diplomat I spoke to joined the Ministry of External Affairs for nationalistic reasons. Rather, diplomats joined to improve their personal lives and the lives of their families and communities. This is contextual thinking at its best. For these people act in terms of their present context rather than some linear history intending to recapture some past and most likely imagined glory of the nation. It is a similar story for the Indian nation state. India's leaders have repeatedly stated that they are not interested in the goal that the West presumes is India's, that is, to become a great power. This is assumed by the West to be India's goal because, of course, the West seeks this. Instead, India's leaders constantly reiterate that the point of their diplomacy is to change the context of Indians, which by and large is one of poverty. Hence, the very rationale is alternate to the West. While it seeks to re recapture or maximize its glory, India simply seeks poverty alleviation and a better life for its people. Furthermore, the manner in which the kind of people who become Indian diplomats today and the state itself seeks to progress, that is eradicate poverty at the individual and national level, is also distinct. It is distinct because of the cosmological foundations of Indian progress. These foundations ensure that neither individuals nor the nation state can progress in a way that harms any other element in the cosmos. This is because in an interlinked cosmos, harming any element is a form of self-harm because we are, after all, all interlinked. Hence, Indians may undoubtedly progress, but only without harming anything. There is one final aspect of cosmological behavior. This interlinked cosmos idea that logically rules violence illogical may be challenged by those who don't follow a cosmological rationale. That suggests such people might be prone to violence and indeed seek to wipe out those who operate on a cosmological footing. The trick, therefore, is for the cosmologically minded to protect their idea, for it is virtuous, as it ensures nonviolence, but they have to protect the idea in a nonviolent manner. To do otherwise is impossible, for it betrays the core notion of an interlinked cosmos. The cosmological rationale I've outlined arises from my unprecedented access to India's foreign ministry. I was embedded in the MEA for over a year, a privilege that no other nation state has granted any outsider. The experience makes for a description of the MEA's present, but the purpose of my project is to also explain the rationale of the practices that compose the present. To do so, I sought not to repeat the mistakes that all analysts of Indian foreign policy make. They do one of two things. They either all fall back on categories developed in Europe, such as realism, idealism, and, and liberalism, to explain us Indians, or they say we are irrational. 
incapable of logical and systematic thought. To use European categories is, of course, not a sin. And realism, idealism, and liberalism may be applicable to Indians. But the total confusion of works that use those categories suggests that scholars are using the wrong tools to understand India. As for the contention that Indian diplomacy is somehow irrational, well, that sounds no different to what the British said about Indians, that we were too immature to rule ourselves, and hence we needed the stewardship of the British. Uninterested in repeating age-old prejudices, I instead sought to make sense of what Indian diplomats do in their own terms. Let me illustrate this with an example. Early on during my attachment with the MEA, I realized new probationers had very little idea of the job that they were supposed to do. They knew what an IAS officer does or what an IPS officer does, but not what a diplomat is expected to do. One day, the foreign secretary at the time came to speak to two batches of probationers. With decades of experience, he knew probationers had difficulty understanding their job. So he began by asking, how many of you know what your job entails? To this, everyone nodded to show that they had no idea. The foreign secretary then said, do you remember what Krishna was doing before the Great War? And everyone replied, yes. The foreign secretary then simply said, that is your job. Something wonderful had just happened at that moment. In an instant, some 40 new probationers immediately understood what their job was about. What is also significant is that these diplomats understood without reference to a European text, but something so Indian that it goes beyond the European concept of religion. After all, the Mahabharata, which is what the foreign secretary was talking about, is something Indians have known for centuries. Unlike the Artha Sastra, as Ambassador Lamba just mentioned, which is paraded by deluded nativist scholars who think that Indian originality lies in claiming we preceded Machiavellian thought and hence realism, the Mahabharata is something that the kind of people who become Indian diplomats today learnt in their mother's lap. They have done so ever since it was written by Brahmins in the language of the masses. And so influential was it that several Mughal rulers had it translated not as a religious text, but as a philosophical one. The Mahabharata then composes the very sinews of Indian society. Closer examination of the text provided explanations of how Indian diplomats and India's diplomacy can both be nonviolent and move in ways quite unexpected. This is because the Mahabharata's lesson is that we live, live in a cosmos, and hence all the rules of cosmological life that are outlined, including progressing contextually and in a nonviolent manner, apply. One of the best illustrations of this is India's nuclear diplomacy, for it encompasses the history of the Indian nation state. India's nuclear diplomacy is usually presented, or rather always presented, as a learning process, with New Delhi starting as idealist and then wallowing in years of what is called ad hocism or irrational behavior. And then there was the moment of epiphany, when we supposedly learned the language of mutually assured destruction from the West. This learning to think like the West for mutually assured destruction was the West's diplomacy, is for some scholars a sign of progress, and for others a sign of regress, depending on their political bent. But what this tale of our learning elides is that perhaps India's leaders were not confused or in need of education, nor that Indian diplomats were simply mimicking Western ways. <coughs> I propose instead that something completely different was and is at work. This becomes evident if only Western categories are ejected and research is conducted on the terms of the practitioners. That is, to make sense of the world 
in terms of the Indian diplomats who are conducting India's diplomacy. To do so avoids the phenomenal hubris so evident in so much writing that the people who have risen to the pinnacle of the Indian state are irrational or that they are in constant need of tutelage from the West. Moreover, the framework I am proposing accounts for India's policy of no first use and credible minimal deterrence without denigrating the formulators of those policies as being solely concerned with mimicking the West or not quite knowing what they were doing. The cosmological framework then accounts for these practices by noting that India was faced with unimaginable violence that could erase the very idea of acting nonviolently, which is so central to Indians. The trick then, as I stated, was to defend the idea, but without replicating the actions of the violent, as in those who threatened India. Hence, India, unlike no other power, sought to challenge the nuclear world, but in a totally novel way. Not by threatening total destruction, but by something altogether different. A relatively minimal response that India assumes would hurt the aggressor enough to deter him from ever attacking. But how can an age-old idea ensconced in the Mahabharata motivate Indian nuclear diplomacy and diplomacy as a totality today. I won't bore you with all the examples from the book. After all, India is presumed a Western copy. The West heroically transplanted its ideas here and miraculously they took root. This astonishing story is however comprehensively undermined by my use of historical documents and sources dating back to pre-British times. The sources demonstrated what actually happened to the Mahabharata's logic of nonviolence. To cut a very detailed story short, under the Mughals, the Mahabharata was understood not as a religious text, but as, but as a philosophical one, as perhaps it was originally intended. My conclusion is that though the Mughals may have begun as standard issue Muslims, as is said on television nowadays, they quite rapidly became something altogether different in South Asia. This included Mughal rulers not only stopping sending tribute to Mecca, but also proposing alliances with infidels against the Caliph of Mecca. I argue that part of this transformation of the Mughals was due to the influence of a text that they engage with, and that is the Mahabharata. If the ancient epic's influence persisted during the Mughal period, what came to pass under the British? Though they actually appropriated wholesale Mughal diplomatic practices, it was motivated, as in the diplomacy of the British, was motivated by something quite alien to the Mahabharata's unified cosmological rationale. Instead, the British operated in terms of a bordered world with fructified into um, impermeable boundaries maintained by the newly invented concept of race. In practice, what this meant was that Indians and their ideas and reasons for conducting diplomacy were cut out of statecraft. And yet I argue that the Mahabharata's idea most cogently and without denigration explains what takes place today. Perplexing this is, so how does the Mahabharata's logic suffice as the only way to logically explain Indian diplomacy today? This is not, however, only because of the kind of Indians who become diplomats today, knowing the epic stories and using them to make sense of the world, as the 40 probationers did when the foreign secretary came to them to explain to them what their job was. Why the Mahabharata? a text definitively extra-European, explains a state presumed Western at inception, becomes apparent if something is done that no scholar has done so far. And that is to view Indian international relations in terms of the most significant relationship in our nation state's history, that between Jawaharlal Nehru 
and his mentor, Mahatma Gandhi. Even a casual perusal of Gandhi's writings show how deeply he was influenced by the Mahabharata. But Gandhi modified the Mahabharata too by solving its greatest inconsistency. While the text forwards the cosmos and nonviolence, the ancient epic was unable to offer a way of dealing with the violent in a nonviolent manner. Gandhi solved this quandary, and he did so by inventing Satyagraha, and his greatest disciple was, of course, Nehru. Nehru remains a subject of debate quite simply because he is understood in terms of either idealism or realism, or some such mixture. But this is an error for not reading Nehru in his own terms, to understand him as he presented himself. Doing so puts the rest to this age-old debate over Nehru, for he was neither a realist or an idealist, but the greatest practitioner of Satyagraha. In applying Gandhi's teachings to international relations, Nehru set in motion a type of foreign policy devoid of Western notions and which chimes with the everyday lives of the kind of people who are increasingly becoming India's emissionaries today. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is one of nonviolent action motivated by contextual thought. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Deep. Um, just a few things. Uh, to begin with, taking up, I found it so interesting that you began with an invocation of borders and of how these seem not to matter in some way. And it immediately struck me that if you look at three classic texts from different bits of the political spectrum, Gandhi's Hind Swaraj, of course, where India is only limbed, defined, by its great centers of pilgrimage, the Tirthas. Um, he's not concerned with borders, longitudes, and latitudes. Uh, even Savarkar, Essentials of Hindutva, uh, who you would think would be concerned with India's territorial boundaries, is in that text not concerned with them, because he limbs them only by very uh, literally fluid geography. The Indus River, on the one hand, and the seas on the other. So, and rivers, as we know, change their courses. Uh, very inexact. And then, of course, Nehru himself, uh, in, I think, The Discovery of India, in which he defines India as that place watered by the monsoons. So India's rea territorial reality literally descends upon it from the skies. It's really wonderful and poetic in the way that Nehru always was. Now, I just wanted to ask you if you, had, if you could say something about how such curiously or apparently non-territorial views of the nation uh, could subtend the very real emphasis on sovereignty, on territorial sovereignty, that also marks uh, India's uh, foreign as well as domestic policy. Yes, thank you very much for that, Faisal. Um, You've, uh, you've asked a very pertinent question, uh, which in a way marks the overlap between modern Western concepts of the nation state and traditional Indian ideas. Uh, what you say about Gandhi, Savarkar, and Nehru was also said to me once by uh, Just One Singh, who said, I don't know of any map that an Indian has ever made. Uh, we are people who don't think in terms of maps. What I think is significant, of course, is um, give, the, the very history that you talk about of, of thought in India uh, is the notion of a, of a conceptual apparatus and a certain set of concepts and ideas that continue to somewhat overlap with the idea of sovereignty. But again, as another Indian Foreign Secretary said to me, uh, unfortunately all of these people have to remain nameless, uh, he said, we are not a fixed entity like Europe. Look at our borders, they're constantly in fluctuation. Our whole idea of sovereignty cannot be captured by the Western notion of sovereignty. Having said that, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 
did, when he became prime minister the first time, begin uh, a, a program which I think was very Nehruvian. It went back to Jawaharlal Nehru in that, in that he began strengthening India's borders with China. Uh, he did so by, uh, by, by building infrastructure and by military facilities and the like. The reason why I draw the parallel with Dr. Singh's policies and with Jawaharlal Nehru's is not to criticize either of them. For I think both of, well, certainly Jawaharlal Nehru's forward policy has been misunderstood by historians, by practically all historians, as being understood as, a, as, a, as I was saying in my talk, a reckless or irrational act of, of politics. What I think was really at operation was something completely different. And that the idea that was in operation was that any state worth its name had to, uh, well, worth the name of India at least, could not just exist because of the notion of sovereignty. It had to exist for some greater reason. And I put down that reason to the lesson that Nehru got from Mahatma Gandhi, that the, the society that was worth defending had to be truthful in the sense that it had to be nonviolent. To protect such a society, of course, what Nehru had to do was to ensure that, this, that the, the people of this society were benefiting from the ideas of nonviolence. And by nonviolence over here, I don't mean someone running against someone else with a stick. I mean the everyday sort of violence that, that is the predilection of, 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 of everyday Indians, of, of the vast majority of Indian people who now increasingly are becoming part of the civil service. And I'm, to, I'm talking about the unspectacular suffering that passes beneath the radars of most, uh, of most uh, intellectuals. For instance, one, uh, one diplomat, young diplomat, said to me that the reason why he became, uh, why he chose to work for the government was because he didn't want to have to constantly pay bribes and, and have to rely on, on contacts, etc., to get things done. And I asked him to explain what, what sort of things. And he said, well, I wanted to move my motorbike from my hometown to Delhi, and I couldn't get a no objection certificate until I paid a bribe. Then, of course, uh, I told the man what my position, my status was, and he allowed me to, to move the bike. So this is the kind of violence that I think both Nehru and Dr. Singh were also trying to eradicate. In doing so, perhaps that can be misread as in some other ways as fortifying the boundary against China or uh, et cetera. It in a way does serve that purpose as well, but that purpose is being served not for the idea, the traditional European idea of sovereignty as in this is, this is our sovereign space, hence we will defend it. But the idea really motivating it is that this is a sovereign space that can only be defended if we can get rid of the violence that, that impinges on everyday Indians' everyday lives. I also, this is somewhat related to it. You know, as historians, um, we are very often put in the position of going back further and further in time. We want to trace uh, what's happening today to increasingly remote cause, causes. Uh, what's also, of course, important, perhaps even more important, is to note the discontinuities in history and how they might come about and be explained. And this surely is true of Indian foreign policy as well. And I'll give you two brief examples, and perhaps you might comment on them. One has to do with Nehru himself. Um, if you see uh, his speeches, uh, which I had occasion to glance over of, say, 1946-47 that deal with foreign policy, they seem, just before independence, right, they seem to mirror in many respects the colonial nature of India's foreign policy, which is to say mm -hmm. India is meant to be a military base for the entire region, in particular for the Middle East and the Western Indian Ocean. India is meant to be a source not only of raw products but of labor, uh, and of soldiers as well uh, for this extended uh, region. And of course, it's also meant to be uh, the place where rival empires, the Russians, the Soviets in that period, and the Chinese uh, might be stalled. Uh, and yet, almost immediately after independence, the story changes. Of course, he unavoidably has to deal with the inheritance of colonial rule, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis countries like China. Uh, but out goes the stuff on uh, Indian labor and other diaspora. Uh, 
outgoes India as a military base for the entire region uh, and as a resource uh, of other kinds as well. And yet we don't think of this as being at all opportunistic. You know, it somehow seems to belong to Nehru. And yet it comes rather suddenly. Similarly, one can take the idea of the Indian Republic itself. You know, here is a category which famously was not given much thought before it was declared. Right? It wasn't really claimed in any serious way, to my knowledge. Uh, there were no great treatises written about it, again, to my knowledge. And yet, when it was declared almost all overnight, it became uh, naturalized immediately. It was seen as belonging uh, to the logic of Indian politics. Uh, so there's, there's something quite interesting and peculiar here. Uh, how might you account for or think about these apparent discontinuities uh, given the focus on lengthy genealogies? Thank you, yes. You've, um, you've touched, touched upon two significant points of Nehru's thinking. And indeed, yes, of course, Nehru's thinking did change. Uh, the short way in which I'll answer the first question is that I, I think in Towards Freedom, uh, Nehru writes, as the average modern, I find Gandhiji's writings very difficult to understand, but I'm grasping my way towards it. Uh, so I think Nehru must be understood in the context of his own time and space, in the very same way that I think Indian diplomats today understand the world and the Indian state understands the world and operates. So to understand Nehru in those terms, rather than just positing him as a brown sub, as is, as is done quite, quite frequently, uh, is to note the, change, the very change in Nehru. Uh, I would suspect uh, that the changes in Nehru's ideas towards what India's role ought to be upon independence were, as you said, were not deeply thought out. And I think, as, as you will know much better than me as a scholar of Indian history, for I am uh, from international relations, uh, Nehru <coughs> was too busy with other matters and the leading uh, lead up to independence to clearly formulate these ideas. What is interesting, of course, is how the new set of ideas that he did come up with uh, came to him and how they became entrenched in the foreign policy of the Indian state. Now, this is often said, well, the, this is often said to be uh, either irrational or that Nehru was using these ideas for what is thought of as traditional uh, real politic uh, interest-based reasons. Uh, I think neither of them does justice to Nehru, and I think this is what most scholars are guilty of, of not taking historical sources on their own terms and, and instead fabricating all sorts of complicated explanations for what they did. I think it's quite simple. If I think, as, one, or one, as, as Nehru himself wrote, one was to take him in the context of his greatest mentor, one can see a symbol or, or a beginning of the kinds of changes that he was inflecting in, uh, in, in Nehru. Indeed, uh, I began with what Nehru said about grasping his way towards Gandhi. Uh, I'll close with say, writing what uh, Gandhi said about Nehru. Uh, he, he once wrote, uh, some people say that there is a cleft between um, Panditji and me. They are mistaken for we are like a bowl of water which no beating of a stick can divide. Yes, that's a wonderful, uh, wonderful anecdote. And the, the last comment question I'd like to make has to do with your discussion earlier of the Mahabharat. I mean, I was struck when you gave us that example of the foreign secretary, I think, a foreign secretary unnamed, uh, who tells uh, a, a bunch of juniors in the ministry uh, do you know what Krishna did? And that's all it took. And that was striking because, well, for many reasons, one of which is nothing had to be spelled out. It was not a normative assessment. Uh, it was not some kind of orthodoxy which can be listed, point one, point two, point three. And that, it seems, is in some ways the essence of the project, and indeed perhaps even of your project because it reminded me of the marvelous chapter you have on, which you also mentioned, on uh, the embassy of uh, Rose Embassy uh, to the court of Jahangir, so the first the British embassy to, uh, to India, in which, of course, uh, the English are uh, infinitely confused. They really don't understand how the imperial court works, 
they think it's all about bribery and such things. And in fact, there are principles behind it, which you show very elegantly. Uh, but among those principles is one of improvisation. Uh, and you use the word jugad, uh, a, certainly a well-known word in this city. Uh, and it's, it, it, it struck me then that the reference to Krishna here uh, is also in its non-normative status a reference perhaps to the improvisational nature of action, of diplomatic, in this case, action that doesn't need to be spelt out, that is never necessarily even spelt out in great books of orthodox foreign policy, as an argument you yourself make in your book. It is indirect. So I'm interested in the indirect way in which politics and policy are thought about in everyday situations by such comments as what did Krishna do? Uh, because it reminded me, and here I have a little quibble of detail with you, of uh, the way in which the Mughals and others indeed did uh, reference texts like the Mahabharat. But of course it isn't only the Mughals and it isn't only in India. Because if you look at that great section of what you might properly call political texts in Persian, uh, the texts of advice to sultans, uh, the preeminent one of which is the famous uh, Siyasat Nama of the Nizamul Mulk, which is what, 11th, 12th century? So well before the Mughals. There you also have citations of the Mahabharat or of the Panchatantra or, you know, uh, they are not accompanied by translations. That happens in the courts of Akbar and Jahangir, etc. Uh, and what seems to be happening in those texts is that the Indian material allows these Islamic, these Muslim author, authors to think about the political as a category in its own right, but to do so indirectly. So they can circumvent the whole normative language of Islam while never ceasing to be Muslim. All right. How do you identify what is politics? How do you identify it in a way that's not entirely normativized, that allows for freedom of interpretation and for improvisation? And this is the way in which the Indian material seems to be used throughout the Islamic world, not just in India, in Persia, in Iraq. Uh, and not only Indian material, ancient Greek material, to some degree Chinese material, Zoroastrian, uh, uh, pre-Islamic Iranian material. So there's a deep intimacy here. But I don't want to go on too long. I just wanted to uh, ask you if you might have something more to say about Jugar or the improvisational or what is open about or non-normative about the uh, thinking and the making of uh, foreign policy? You've answered a many layered, you've asked a many layered question, Faisal. So I'll, I'll try and unpack it in, in, in certain layers. I won't keep necessarily to the order in which you ask them. Uh, let me begin by stating that uh, this, this book is about trying to figure out what are the practices within the MEA today? How do people uh, think about things? I, I, and how do they ultimately make foreign policy? I begin by asking, by ans I begin to answer this by not using theories uh, taken from elsewhere, but by actually asking Indian practitioners today why they even want to become diplomats. And then what are the ideas, et cetera, that they bring? What are the ideas, et cetera, that the ministry has and how these get played around with and worked through? So that is the sort of notion of politics I think you're talking about, the, how, how is politics understood. Um, now the way in which the co politics of today are conducted are, as, as I describe them, not entirely explicable in the sense that has been outlined in uh, European theory. So for instance, I didn't find any, no, any sort of remnant or uh, any, any variation of the notion of, say, the Protestant work ethic. I found something quite different, in, for which reason, of course, I had to try and, and make up uh, this notion of the cosmological, which happily then seemed to chime with the very text that was being used by the Foreign Secretary to make sense of, uh, of the diplomats' jobs to the diplomats. Uh, in that sense, the notion of politics, what I'll use a slightly different phrase. I'll, I, the phrase that I use in the book is an, an ideas toolkit. Um, and what I'm trying to essentially bring to the fore is the very ideas toolkit that Indian diplomats use to think about the world. Uh, 
So instead of going through case studies of the, of the limitless variations of what the real world throws up, instead I'm trying to present the very idea through which Indian diplomats would deal with the, with the huge variety of tasks that they, that they deal with. Um, in this sense, of course, the, the Mahabharata, uh, as, as Faisal said, has been translated uh, by, by, by Muslims in India long before the period that I actively deal with. Now, the reason with, uh, I, well, I don't deny that, and I think uh, I do note that it was in the 11th century that one of the first translations was ma made, and it was called the Ras Nama, or the Book of War. Um, I, I deal with the period really uh, leading up to the British. The reason why I deal with the period leading up to the British is because, as is understood in, the, in, the, in academia, at least within the discipline of international relations, is that the very ideas of diplomacy that, are, that, that motivate Indians and, and everyone else in the third world today come originally from Europe. Hence, I wanted to determine what actually was the situation, what was the case uh, preceding Europe's arrival. Now, this, the, the, the difference, well, the, the first moments of the interaction between the, the Mughal Empire and, uh, and, and the British were marked by perhaps mutual incomprehension. I'm, I'm not sure if, if that really is the case or not. But then the first success was, of course, the Sermon Embassy of, I think, 1719, which is the one that negotiated the right to tax the 38 villages in Bengal. Now, what is very interesting about how this mission operated was, uh, what, and the reason why it's interesting is because one can see the beginnings of the kind of difference that I outline exists today between Western diplomacy and Indian diplomacy. So John Sermon was marked by this incredible ability to adapt, but at the same time, he believed that the only way he could gain his treaty, his firman from the Mughal emperor, was by paying bribes. And indeed, the sort of bribes he paid in today's currency, roughly translated, would be well over five or six billion dollars. Uh, so that was the kind of money he was paying. Yet, he did not get anywhere despite paying these bribes. The reason why he was paying these bribes was because the British, as I was saying, uh, thought in a very linear and binary way. We are good, we are bringing our civilization here, and they must be corrupt, hence they are in need of our civilizing touch. Um, now, Sermon didn't get what he wanted by paying the bribes, and then various other situations came into play, and um, he did something which right from the beginning he had sought not to do. He had sought not to follow the standard court protocol that one needs to follow to get such a treaty of firman granted. He, instead of going to the wazir, as was uh, stipulated by the Mughal Empire, he went to a much lower official, thinking that he could pay his way through using that lower official and get what he wanted. That completely failed, and it, and it failed for three years. Then finally, for various reasons, he actually did go to the wazir, and the wazir, promptly seeing the, the usefulness of the British case, granted him what he wanted. Now, despite being granted what he wanted by the wazir, uh, Sermon, by the way, in his diary, notes this as if in passing, which, which is quite indicative, because for three years, he's been writing back to Calcutta saying that I'm not going to go to the wazir, and then finally he does go to the wazir, but just mentions it in passing. And then he gets the firman, but then the Mughal emperor didn't want the British to leave. And the reason why he didn't want the British to leave was because the English doctor had healed the emperor. And so the emperor did was loath to see the British go. Now, now this is what I find incredible, is that the British then fell back again on their old stereotype that the Indians were debased and corrupted and again went to the law officials to try and get them to leave. And yet again, he failed. And then he records in his diary that the wazir uh, again intervened and released them to, to leave uh, the court and go return to Calcutta. This, I think, is, is quite interesting. And I think this is a dynamic that plays out through the British period in India. The, at the, on the one hand, the British were incredibly flexible and adaptable. They were willing to do everything even resort to corrupt practices if they to get their way. But at the same time, they would not learn from their experience of the actuality of Indian politics, of what was actually happening. And I think this is due to the underlying rationality of binarism and linear thought, which I was, which I was detailing in my talk. 
In stark contrast, I think the Indian way in which Indian diplomats operate and function, and in, way, in the way in which the state operates and functions, is completely the opposite. It is entirely contextual and involves learning in context from experience. So hence, uh, the difference in action is that in the Indian way, one must think deeply about everything that impinges upon one's context before taking some action. Whereas in the British way, one continues to act based on a set of ideas and never learning from context. And I think this is the difference in politics between the two people. And I think that one can see the same dynamic being reiterated. For instance, when uh, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh was prime minister, I think at some point Condoleezza Rice uh, offered India to in, offered to make uh, India a great power, and Pranab Mukherjee, who was then the foreign minister, said once again, "We are not interested in becoming a great power. We are interested in alleviating poverty in our nation now." So, hence, despite India continuously reiterating its its position and its take on politics, the West, or at least in this case Washington, uh, was unable to learn the, the, the message that India was speaking. It perhaps has now learned that message, but that is a different set, for a different set of reasons that perhaps experience, which we don't need to go into now. Thank you very much. Yes, I think I we should think open up. We can have some time for a question and answers, about 10 minutes. And whoever is asking a question, please identify. Yes, sure, the first. Thank you very much. I happen to be a guest of uh, Mr. Cherian here, coming from Europe, and I have many European hats, being born in France, from Swiss parents and Austrian and Italian grandparents. So I'd like to challenge you just for, for the fun of it. I haven't read your book, but I've read the title. I'd like to ask you, what do you think about the new Europe which in a way is built on nonviolence as a concept and has quite movable borderlines as well because we might lose Greece in a few days, maybe the UK in a couple of years. Don't you see a parallel here? Is it that? Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, yes, the, the idea of nonviolence is, um, is not, I think, perhaps not unique to Indians. But the reason for embarking upon nonviolence, I think, differs. And I'll give you an example, again, from Dr. Singh's tenure. Uh, his national security advisor, Mr. Narayanan, uh, was asked what was he uh, doing when the nuclear deal was, when he got news of that the nuclear deal had been signed. He said he was praying. And then he was asked what was the big difference between Indian and, nego and, and, um, and American negotiating strategies. And he used this analogy. He said, uh, well, we both get married, but they like prenuptials. The point of it is that we all eat, but, the, but why we eat and how we eat differs. And I'm using this analogy to talk about nonviolence. So hence, what I'm outlining is a, is a consistent and logically sound rationale for nonviolence as developed in India. In the reasons for which it may have developed in Europe, well, I'm not quite sure of that, but perhaps Europe's very bloody past may have a, have a role in it. As for malleable boundaries, um, well, look at the amount of distress and concern that uh, the Greek exit is causing your, the European Union. In any case, think about it. The European Union is a very recent idea. Uh, it is a recent idea, unlike, say, the idea of, of, the, of Great Britain. Uh, but yet, uh, such a recent idea is causing such strife within Europe as to what will happen. And compare that with the notion of India, which has large swaths of territory, which lay, uh, have lain undemarcated for, for a long time. And as Dr. Singh uh, pointed out on several times during his premiership, that, um, that the greatest threat to India comes not from some external threat, but the vast uh, situation of, of uncontrolled law and order in the center of India, the Naxalite uprising. So Indians that have a way of living with this kind of uh, state without a state which I think is quite novel and different from the European experience. Yes. Um, yeah, hi. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Ujbal Krishna. I'm studying economics at Delhi University. 
And I was quite interested with uh, uh, when you talked about what, what the average, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, di diplomat is like in the Indian Foreign Service. What are his motivations for joining the Foreign Service and becoming a diplomat in the first place? Um, you, you see, you talked about how the fi Foreign Secretary may, uh, you know, alluded to what Krishna's role was uh, you know, before the war in Mahabharat, and that seemed to lead to some kind of an instinctive understanding in the young diplomat's mind that you know this is what broadly my role will be as a diplomat in my career. Uh, do you feel uh, that you know uh, that sort of instinctive prod, uh, you know, at, at a talk or a seminar like this, is is, is enough for uh, a, a diplomat to chart out, a, a, you know, a larger view for his for, for his career in the future, or do you think at some level the fault does lie in uh, in in the structure of of training and and examinations that that lead to a, a diplomat, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know. Uh, his intake and you know uh, actually functioning in the foreign service in the first place. So, do you think uh, you know there, there might be an inconsistency there, or is it simply uh, justified by our uh, by our instinctive nature uh, worldview as it is? Well, thank you, for, thank you very much for that. That's a very pertinent question. Um, I will actually flip what you uh, said. The that instinctive uh, reaction to the text is enough for the larger worldview, but it is not perhaps enough for the detailed everyday work of diplomats. So the difference is that the larger framework, I see no reason uh, to critique it, because the larger framework seems a quite sensible way of conducting not, a na not just a nation's foreign policy, but an individual's way of acting. Essentially, the point is that you, the Indians think, and this, there's a long history of this, that. Uh, we are all interconnected, so therefore any form of violence to anything is a form of cell violence, so one must n be nonviolent. But of course, one must move and gain one, what one wants, but to, one must do that in a nonviolent way. This is the broad principle, the idea, but how one makes those, takes those steps. Now, those ideas, I think, um, have, have in, in India's case, always come from the prime minister, uh, as is well known. Uh, the one, two, three agreement was Dr. Singh's um, idea, and, and he made it happen. What I would like to see happen, in, happen more successfully, I think, is that have greater numbers of Indian diplomats today who are willing and capable of outlining such ideas, of conducting the very simple operations of alleviating the everyday violence that Indians face in their everyday life. And it, and it is this that the Indian diplomats, I suspect, need to be provided some sort of, of greater training in terms of specialization, or not only in various aspects of economic diplomacy, but also foreign trade and what other countries do and are thinking. Yes. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is uh, Vinay Bhushan. I just completed my master's in international relations and I'm currently interning with the Ministry of External Affairs in South Block. Uh, during my dissertation for my master's degree, I read cover to cover Henry Kissinger's latest book, The World Order. And what Mr. Kissinger says very clearly in the book is he talks about the peace of Westphalia and how it gave rise to what is today the Westphalian concept of nation state and how that originated in Europe in the 17th century and, and has now been absorbed by different regions of the world, Latin America, Africa, Asia, etc. And ironically, as we move into the 21st century, it is these Western countries that want to somehow dilute the absolutist nature of the Westphalian concept of nation state through various international regimes, through concepts, doctrines such as, say, responsibility to protect, etc. And it is the Asian countries or the African countries that stand up and talk about the Westphalian concept of sovereignty uh, as if it is theirs, <laughs> which is actually a European concept. So it is, uh, so it is flag. It is holding up the piece of Westphalia back to the West and saying, "Look, this is not acceptable. You're talking of responsibility to protect, etc., to interfere in our affairs." So, uh, so are we barking up the wrong tree when we try to criticize and uh, keep mentioning uh, the modern concept of nation state as, as something Western? and not relevant to us when it is us, the, the so-called, the developing world, like China, India, etc., that have absorbed it fully and, and, want, it, and want to practice it in its uh, most pristine sense as uh, derived from the 17th century. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you. You've uh, hit a conundrum at the, at the heart of the Westphalian notion. The Westphalian notion, of course, comes, is, is, a, is descended from, the, from, the, from, from European Christianity. Uh, I mean, to, to brief, briefly, putting it briefly, uh, the Vatican unified the peoples of Europe. Then, for various reasons, the Vatican lost its power as people f began to lose their faith. And Europe began to organize its, uh, itself in, in terms of states. And this is where diplomacy is supposed to have been born, as, as uh, Kissinger rightly says. But what Kissinger misses out is that this idea of, of the Westphalian state has uh, a problem, a deep problem, right at the heart of the project. And this is what I suspect Western nations are beginning to realize now. And that conundrum is that how can one have a, remember, Westphalia was replacing the Vatican and how it unified everyone uh, on Earth, or at least in Western Europe. This idea was being replaced by modern diplomacy, which is supposed to bring everyone together, but at the same time brings everyone together by setting up hard boundaries, national boundaries. So you see, it's supposed to bring everyone together by having a common diplomatic system, but what it's bringing together are people who are supposedly intrinsically different to each other and therefore need this diplomatic system to bring them together. So this conundrum is at the heart of the Westphalian project and I think uh, perhaps Westphalian idea. As for what uh, various other states around the world say about the Westphalian project, of course I'm no expert on, on the rest of the world, but I will say this, that the, when India talks about sovereignty, etc., one must again, as I said, look at the very particular context of why those states, statements are being made and what purpose they serve. So in terms of maintaining sovereignty or not, the way in which that sovereignty is being understood by Indian diplomats and the purpose to which that argument is being utilized. And I suspect what you will see is that you, if you will see what is the, the Duke's ex machina, what is working in the background is the model that I outlined. Well, thank you very much. I think we have, uh, we should at this time conclude. I'd like to thank the author, the participants, and you, sir, for being present here today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, may I please request you to please remain seated in your seats till Honorable Dr. Man